I got into MIT and graduated early with my computer science degree. Here's how I did it. Hi friends. I'm Maddie. I'm now a senior software engineer and I graduated a semester early with my bachelor's in computer science and engineering from MIT. I previously worked at Google and during MIT, I interned at companies including Amazon, Microsoft, Morgan Stanley, and IBM. If you're new here, I post coding memes and tech insights over on Instagram, so go and follow me there if that interests you. And I always get people asking me how I got into MIT in my comments and DMs. In this video, I'll give my take on not just how I got in, but also how I survived as someone who honestly isn't naturally that good at coding. I'll go into what I did to get a accepted and graduate early, what I would change if I applied in 2025, and tips to help you with your application. My background for MIT was very much not coding heavy. Sure, I took AP computer science in high school, but honestly, I never thought I would become a software engineer or study computer science. I was always pretty good at math and science, but coding wasn't exactly my strong suit or favorite class. A lot of my classmates had been coding since middle school, had published apps and papers, and won national competitions. Well, I just knew how to make a for loop and barely understood what object-oriented programming meant. However, I really did have a fascination with how the world worked. When I was little, I once asked my grandfather, who is a chemical engineer, so many questions about how the world worked and got into such a deep rabbit hole that my mom eventually got tired of hearing of us talk for hours and hours and banished us to the guest room to finish the conversation. During high school, I cold emailed UC Berkeley professors until I got one to take me on as an intern at his phytomediation lab for the summer. Let's talk about what MIT is truly looking for in 2025 in the parts of your application. First, obviously, standardized tests and grades are important. Even though I did have classmates who didn't get the best grades or SAT scores in high school, I would say that this is the exception rather than the rule, as you can see from the middle 50% score range in this table. Personally, I was my high school's valedictorian, took 13 total AP or advanced placement classes, which was every single AP we offered except for AP French, earned all A's, and scored a 2380 in the SAT back in the old days when the SAT was out of 2400. Besides grades, it's also important to keep extracurriculars in mind. There is no real right or wrong answer for which activities are prioritized by MIT admissions officers. I'd aim for a mix of academic and non-academic ones, focus on quality over quantity, and be sure to show leadership. After all, make sure to show that you're genuinely interested in these activities and not just doing them to check boxes. I personally actually ended up with quite a few extracurriculars. For example, I was president of both the science competition club and biology club, co-president of both model UN and quiz bowl, vice president of the history competition club, co-vice president of math club and Spanish culture club, varsity tennis team captain and made the varsity track and field team, played piano and ballroom dance competitively and won various awards for both, completed two research internships at UC Berkeley and a pharmaceutical company, and for volunteer work I tutored science, math, and played piano for a local church. If I could do things differently in 2025, I would honestly probably focus on getting more sleep and doing less activities, but I'm not actually sure which ones I would cut. I genuinely love all of them and they were always a nice break from schoolwork. As you're starting your last year of high school, think about the letters of recommendation you'll request. MIT asks for two letters of recommendation from your teachers to help the admissions committee learn about an applicant's character beyond what you say you so yourself. When requesting letters of recommendation, it's important to ask early, at least one to two months in advance, so your teachers have enough time to write a thorough and detailed letter. Choose one science and math teacher and one humanities teacher because this combination forms a balanced picture of your abilities. Next, let's talk about the application essays. Essays are arguably one of the most important and least straightforward parts of the MIT application. MIT doesn't ask for the common app that many universities in the United States use. Instead, they have their own custom essays. MIT requires five 200 word essays. The prompts ask about what you do for fun, a challenge you faced, your field of interest, why MIT specifically, and have you contributed to your community. Ironically, even though the essays are short, it actually makes it harder in some ways to write because you have to be purposeful about every single word you choose. When writing your essays for 2025 applicants, I recommend reading the MIT blogs. These blogs, which can be found at mitadmissions.org slash blogs, are quite unique to MIT. They are a series of writings by MIT students and faculty that offer a glimpse into life at MIT, including research, student initiatives, campus events, and personal reflection. They're a lot more real, in my opinion, than any other college tour or official admissions. For the what do you do for fun essay, you don't need to sound impressive. The admissions officers genuinely just want to know who you are and what makes you tick. They can learn about your academic achievements from other parts of your app. My friends who went to MIT with me wrote about widely different topics from anything from fire spinning to ramen making to music and so much more. For the challenge you face question, make sure not only to describe the situation and how difficult it was, but also explain how you solved or improved the situation and what you learned. Make sure to reflect on how this experience has shaped you and how it will influence your future decisions. And just remember, the key with these essays is to be authentic and specific. For the your field of interest and why MIT essays, don't 
only mention general things like world-class education or great professors. Do some research and name specific professors, labs, or student groups that speak to you and align with your personal interests. And finally, for the how you've contributed to your community question, make sure to not only reflect on how your contributions have benefited others, but also how they've influenced your own values and perspectives. When I was applying, I wrote these essays quite last minute, which was so stressful. If I could go back, I would allocate time for brainstorming, writing the essay, and getting feedback from my friends before rewriting. You might get scheduled for an alumni interview. This is optional and honestly based on the availability of alumni in your area. Getting an interview doesn't mean you'll definitely get into MIT. Not getting one does not mean that you're getting rejected. The best advice I can give for this is to just be yourself. Don't worry about giving perfect answers. Usually the officers will try to pair you with an alumni who has similar interests to you, so use this opportunity to learn about what opportunities to pursue those interests MIT can offer you. This is not an interrogation, but actually a two-way street. As much as your interviewer is learning about you, you are also learning about if MIT might be a good fit for you. MIT truly emphasizes its values when figuring out who to accept. Now for the big question. What does MIT truly value? Here are some of the core things MIT is looking for in its admits. MIT wants students whose goals and values align with MIT's mission to make the world a better place. We have students developing sustainable energy solutions, creating affordable healthcare technologies for underserved populations, and multiple clubs that organize STEM outreach for underrepresented communities. I personally was on the exec team for quite a few of these clubs. MIT values collaboration. MIT has a strong emphasis on interdisciplinary research, and many of MIT's homeworks are specifically supposed to be worked on in groups. Unlike what you might find in some other schools, MIT computer science is the opposite of cutthroat. I can't count the number of times my friends would set aside their own homework to help me first, just because. MIT wants applicants who demonstrate initiative and are not afraid to take calculated risks. We have programs for startups and entrepreneurship, and there's an MIT club called Projects that gives students funding for side projects. These funding and opportunities are plentiful, but students have to actively go for them. MIT wants students who enjoy applying theoretical knowledge to real-world problems through hands-on projects. For example, my old dorm East Campus builds roller coasters during orientation week, and EuroOps, or undergraduate research opportunity programs, are incredible chances where students can work with world-class professors on cutting-edge research. The best thing about EuroOps is that professors often don't require prior experience. They just want students who are genuinely willing and interested in getting involved in research. MIT looks for students deeply invested in their passions. The only thing I can say all MIT admits have in common is that they are all truly passionate and all in on their interests, academic or non-academic. MIT wants people who contribute positively to MIT's community. Something I learned during our accepted students visiting weekend was that the events to introduce us to campus are almost all entirely run by students students, with very few being officially organized by the admin. This student-driven approach truly speaks volumes about the tight-knit community at MIT. For example, I remember having so much fun making nitrogen ice cream, running around for bubble soccer, playing life-size Hungry Hungry Hippos, solving a custom-made escape room, listening to a cappella performances, and touring the frats and sororities. That weekend was what solidified my decision to go to MIT. It's kind of sad for me to say so, but I never really felt like I belonged anywhere before MIT. And after I became a student, MIT truly felt like home. And Finally, MIT wants its students to prioritize balance. To be honest, I would say this is the value that the least amount of its students truly embody. MIT students often are so incredibly passionate about their academic and extracurricular pursuits that they're juggling intense coursework, research, startups, leadership roles in clubs, and even athletic commitments. It's that intense yearning for learning and innovation that really defines the MIT experience, but it also presents challenges when it comes to personal balance. I can really relate to this struggle. Now for the fun part. How do you actually survive once you're in? MIT is famous, or rather infamous, for what's called the fire hose. Imagine trying to drink from a fire hose instead of a water fountain. That's how much information gets thrown at you. We have this saying called IHTFP. It originally stands for, I hate this effing place. While for some people like me, it eventually became, I have truly found paradise, the original meaning did resonate a lot at times. MIT is hard really hard. Before I learned to be better at work-life balance, I found myself overwhelmed a lot. I had multiple breakdowns and cried so, so many times. My physical health also suffered. I once missed a final because of a two-hour nosebleed that would not stop and I had to make it up a couple of semesters later. Here are the tips I learned through literal blood, sweat, and tears. First up, productivity tools. I am obsessed with Google Calendar and no, I'm not just saying that because I worked at Google. Back in university, I used Google Calendar to time block my day for different homework or exams to study for, gym, me 
meals and social activities. I also use Todoist to meticulously plan my deadlines, breaking tasks down to subtasks to make them more realistic and achievable. Pomodoro. This is a technique where you alternate work and break sessions. Pick a task and set a timer for 25 minutes. During that time, work with full focus, no distractions, no checking your phone. When the timer goes off, then take a five minute break to relax and stretch, and then dive back in for another 25 minute session, break for five minutes, and go over and over again. Study groups. Find reliable study buddies early. MIT computer science is not something you want to tackle alone. AI. So I actually graduated before ChatGPT was a thing, but in 2025, learning when and how to leverage tools like ChatGPT, Copilot, or Claude for homework help would be super useful. However, keep in mind that you should use AI to augment your learning, not replace it. Strategic course planning. Balance your course load every semester. I was able to graduate early, honestly, because I spread out my harder classes throughout the years and mapped out what classes I would take to fulfill which requirements. MIT actually has a student-made website, Hydrant, which is previously Firehose, which updates every semester with the course catalog and class times, allowing students to easily search for classes, view schedules, and create their ideal course plan. Exercise. Physical health is important in maintaining your mental health. During the middle of MIT, I started running every single day. I've kept up that habit until today. In six years, I've only missed four total days of running. One when I was in the hospital, one when I was in an airport for over 24 hours, and two when I was recovering from wisdom teeth extraction. All right, this is all the advice I have for you today. Let me know if you have any other questions for me in the comments. If you'd like to see more computer science and software engineering videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.